Hey everybody, it's Jeremiah Polachek, and in this video I'm going to be answering 10 questions that ChatGPT came up with for me about my artistic practice and what I'm doing with this school that I started in Prague, Czech Republic called Oko Academy. So, question number one, what inspired you to become an artist and how did you discover passion for oil paint? So, I can actually get the painting here. This is one of my grandma's paintings. And um, she was a painter, self-taught, uh, would be considered like an outsider artist. And she made a lot of paintings in her house in Kansas. And she even named it the Earth Music Gallery. And her house was absolutely packed full of paintings. And I would only visit there in the summers for, for a few weeks. So my memories of that place are very, very bright and vibrant. And um, I'm sure certainly exaggerated in some regards as well. But that time period that I spent there was obviously extremely important because I got to be around a ton of paintings. I mean, her walls were just full of these all sorts of different paintings. She did abstract paintings. Uh, she did paintings, uh, figurative work, she did folk painting, kind of folk paintings of like a blacksmith and a guy, you know, uh, trying to break a horse or somebody milking a cow. And then she also did um, a bunch of paintings where she looked through a magnifying glass at rotting wood. And then she made these big uh, abstract paintings based on these little microscopic looks at rotting wood and this sort of things. So she was like a very, very serious painter in a lot of regards. And growing up around this type of painting and painting being taken seriously and as something that's normal and fills up a house and takes up all the walls was certainly something that was extremely influential for me growing up. Um, yeah, if you want to see her paintings, you can go to frantiska.com. Uh, I put up like 50 or 60 images of her work up there. Um, but yeah, we have an archive, a big archive of her work still that we have to figure out what are we doing with all these paintings, which is part of the life of paintings too, right? So question number two, what's a specific moment that deeply influenced your artistic journey? A specific moment. I would have to say one of the most important and it might be strange for the person I'm talking about to, if he hears it, um, was in my town, Bismarck, North Dakota, where I grew up, there was an artist named John Twingley. His dad was also my art uh, teacher in high school. And John Twingley has since, you know, has a very pr prolific and established career as an illustrator. And um, he would just go with me drawing. And my parents paid him, I think, like 10 or 20 bucks a lesson or something like that. And he would just go drawing with me for like two or three hours. And I still remember we went to the circus. We went to the circus one day. Um, another time we went to the zoo and they had like a Tiger King sort of guy there, um, like with a liger. And so we like drew the liger together at the zoo. And um, these kind of moments of just, you know, the materials were so simple, and that was something that's so frustrating, I think, when you're starting out as an artist, is that the materials can be so simple that you're using, you know, like a pen and some paper and a drawing board. And, you know, I would have the same materials that he did, and, like, it's just all, you know, embodied in the hand itself. So those moments of going out and drawing from life um, especially where people were, where there was kind of like an event that was goofy and strange, like a circus is kind of a goofy place, and um, paint or going and drawing a liger is also kind of goofy. Um, those two things definitely were pivotal moments, and I was like, like 18 years old, 17 or 18 years old probably at the time as well. So it was also, you know, the, the choice was being made, um, do I go to art school or... What do I do? So yeah, I would say those would be a very pivotal moment. Number three, what are some routines and rituals that you do for your studio to get in the mood to paint? 
Um, I listen to probably way too much political stuff when I'm painting. I even had to like stop listening to it um, because I was listening to like way too much political commentary and these sorts of things in the background. But I'll usually listen to podcasts um, for my figure drawing night that I do here. I actually made a separate playlist for that that was all like chill because usually I make a lot of playlists um, in Spotify. And so I've got dozens and dozens of playlists there, but most generally my style of making a playlist is extremely jumbled and it can be, you know, some like contemporary weird experimental music, something like Yonis Sinakis, and then the next song is like Cardi B or something. And that's not really conducive <laughs> to anybody but me and people kind of complain about my playlists being like too jumbled. And strange like when there's a barbecue people are like, what is happening um, but yeah I made the uh, figure drawing playlist and I've been listening to that sometimes when I'm working or I'll listen to fade waves in the background silence is good of course um, but you know it's easy to, to put on some uh, political stuff debate bros this sort of stuff on in the background and listen to it while I work or listen to some podcast something like that why did you, uh, question number four, why did you start your own school? What values or principles guide the approach? So I decided to start Oko Academy because I wanted to teach painting and there wasn't really a place for, for uh, English speakers in Prague to just study painting um, just in, in a kind of an academic and traditional sense. Um, I studied for one year at a place called the Lyme Academy of Fine Arts and um, that was kind of my first big real jaunt into you know the, the real art world or whatever you want to call it because um, I moved to Connecticut and I studied there at the uh, Art Academy and I'm still I'm sure it's still amazing I have great memories uh, from that school and um, there it was you know just figure drawing non-stop you could sneak it not sneak in you could just go to other figure drawing like nights there it seemed like um some days i honestly felt like i would go in at like nine in the morning and come out at like nine or ten at night and i would be in class like most of the time uh somehow so that was awesome and um, just the observational approach i thought was really amazing and then I transferred out of there and ended up going to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And the main reason I transferred out was because I wanted, like kind of wanted more freedom. And as you can see with my paintings, they're kind of more in, like, they're not traditional academic figure paintings. And I love that stuff. I love traditional figurative work in a lot of respects, but it's just not something that I do. And so what I'm doing here at Oko Academy and what kind of sets us apart, I guess, is that I like this academic model of looking and using observation, of observation-based approach to learning how to paint and draw and how to mix color and how to, you know, just have a shadow that's the right um, value and these sorts of things. I think that's super important. And I also think that branching off from uh, these traditional academic models where we all kind of know how the drawings are supposed to look in the end. Like, you know, it's funny because it's associated, I was talking to somebody from Taiwan the other day and I asked him about like traditional figurative work. And he said in, they actually call it Chinese, Chinese painting. They refer to it as that. And it's like, you know, you know what it looks like. If somebody's very, very good at an academic drawing sense, it looks a very certain way, and that's awesome. Um, and I want to make sure people have that academic like foundation so they can mix the right value and they can draw the line in the way they, that they want to, but also branch off from that and create a class, like course framework that allows them to branch out from uh, just making those sorts of academic drawings and be more expressive with what they want to convey through their artwork. All right, number five, how do you balance making a curriculum with, how do you balance making your own work with a structured curriculum of a school? So I kind of already answered that, I guess. 
So what's the difference between my painting and teaching somebody else how to paint? I've kind of went into that already. I can teach people how to just mix color, you know, um, how you apply it is up to you, but looking, seeing, measuring, how to put color down, it's all just the basic fundamentals of painting. So those things can be taught regardless. Uh, number six, a challenge you faced for painting as well as opening your own school. Um, some, I kind of got lucky, I guess, with this space, that I found this space. It's very, very small. So the main challenge is making sure all the students have enough space. So everyone has like a little table and an easel and they can kind of feel like they have their own space. I've noticed at a lot of other um, figure drawing nights, especially, it can be just unbelievably packed, which is understandable because you want to get as many people in to make more money, right? Um, but it also can be really, really cramped and easily distracting. So one thing I wanted for this space was to ensure everybody has their own space. They have their own light on their easel. We turn the lights off and we light the model. And then every easel also has its own light. And, and so those that the main thing for me is just space. Like I would, if I had a space twice this size, it would make things so much easier. Uh, but the rent is nice here. And it's a good location in Zhishkov, which is, you know, one of the most vibrant uh, neighborhoods in Prague. It's just a block away from the TV tower, if you're familiar with that. But it is very, very small. It's a very, very small room. So I can only have like four to five students per class, which is good for them, I guess, as well, because the class sizes are pretty small. Can you share a breakthrough moment with a student? Number seven. Um, I remember early on I, ha I studied elementary art and I had to work with, we had to work individually with a student at an elementary level. He was like a fifth grader or something like that. And um, it was like, I just talked to him. He was really into car stereos. So I just talked to him about car stereos and we were supposed to draw a bike. So they put a bike in the center of the room. Everybody gets a piece of paper and a pencil and you gotta draw the bike. And um, so I kind of got him started and I was like, oh yeah, you know, this is how you, you don't have to like see, think about the shapes, you know, the whole basic thing, like breaking down symbols versus what you see and this sort of thing. And um, take a line for a walk, you know? And I was just, did that with him. And uh, he was drawing, he was drawing really well. It was an awesome bike drawing. And uh, I just talked with him about car stereos the entire time. And then after class, like the, the main teacher in the class was like, how did you, how did you get him to sit still? Like he's like sharpening his pencil usually every five minutes and you know, um, all this sort of stuff. And I was like, I don't know. I just talked to him about car stereos or whatever. But um, from that moment, he like really took to art and drawing and these sort of things. And you know, having worked with that um, same situation throughout the semester became apparent that this was a way, an outlet for him to focus and a way that um, he could work that he really enjoyed. So that was awesome. I think he was, yeah, I think he was a fifth grader. So number eight, why do you paint as you do and how has it evolved? Um, when I first started out painting, I was pretty, um, I liked Philip Burke, which is kind of a strange person. He was like an illustrator for Rolling Stone and he did like, you know, paintings of, musicians and stuff. This is like when I was like 17 or 18 years old. Um, so I kind of was trying to paint in this very colorful style, but paying attention to the values and this sort of thing. And then I kind of got into this Degas and Diebenkorn phase where I was just big into figures and interiors. And um, during that period, I'm just like making a lot of paintings of figures and interiors. And treating the figure the same as the space, the whole gestalt of the painting that the figure should not be differentiated from the entire space that it's in. And that was really my approach to a lot of types of painting. From there, I started making all these suburban paintings of like suburban houses and all this sorts of stuff. Um, then I made a bunch of paintings of video games. I made a bunch of paintings of TV screens of movie stills. Um, taking little elements of video games. That was kind of my deal for quite a long time. Memes, I was painting memes 
like in 2006, 2007 or so, some of the early memes, I started painting internet culture. I was really interested in like translating the digital world into physical oil painting world. And from that, it kind of morphed into these portraits, which you can see on my website or whatever, um, and these larger figure in landscape and figure in interior works that these giant bodies are kind of fragmented digital creatures that are breaking apart and their bodies are stretching in incredible, impossible ways. And uh, the paintings are more about just the digital self versus like your physical body in reality. So it's a pretty simple idea. And, uh, but it still fits in the tradition of figurative painting and uh, figures in interiors, figures in landscapes, these sorts of things. Number nine, what unique aspects or philosophies set Oko Academy apart from others? Um, so I charge 600 crowns for a lesson in a class. So you can be in a class with like four people or whatever. Um, and I think the, the main thing that kind of sets me apart would probably be like a pretty extensive historical art historical knowledge of a lot of different painters and a lot of different people. Whereas a lot of these kind of like little art school type things, um, which this is too, or I'm not acting like I'm a, some giant university or anything or an established, you know, figurative academy by that matter. Um, but a lot of these little smaller art studios and art schools and these sorts of things, they'll often have classes where, for instance, you just have the student bring in a picture and then you teach them how to grid your canvas and then maybe mix some colors or something like that. Uh, like I said before, my, my approach is in class is all observation based. So we have a live model for figure drawing nights. Um, for still lifes, we set up still lifes and properly light them and then just go through the process of painting them. And believe it or not, this is not very common because it's, it's a pain, you know? It's a pain to get over that initial hump of learning to draw. And it's, it's a lot easier to use the grid method from a photograph to make a painting of a rabbit. Um, and there's great paintings of rabbits. Albrecht Dürer probably has the best painting of a rabbit ever. But you know what I'm saying? Like you make the grid of the painting of the rabbit and then you put the rabbit on your wall and you're like, oh, that's a pretty good rabbit. Um, but you didn't actually learn those observational skills that are going to open up a million more doors. So I guess that's what kind of sets us apart is this focus on observation. So number 10, what advice do you have for someone who is passionate and dreams of making art or teaching? I'd say the most important thing is, you know, daily work. Try to work 15 minutes every single day and uh, just keep a sketchbook. and. Once a week, at the end of the week, maybe Sunday or something like that, pick a day and evaluate what you've done the entire week. Look at, you know, your short-term goals. Did I achieve these things or not? And then make sure when you're, you're planning your next week that you come up with a very, very simple goal which you can, you know, check mark if you've achieved it or not. Something that you can kind of hold yourself to. So you look at where you are with your work, and then you look at um, where you want to be and you create small little goals to get there and then you have weekly missions to get to those goals. Can, you can do that for anything. It will, it'll work for anything. So thanks a lot for watching uh, ChatGPT interview me. Um, and if you're interested in learning to paint and you live in Prague or you want to come to visit Prague and you want to do an art lesson or a painting lesson or a figure drawing night while you're here just uh, you can go to oko.academy and you can write me an email there to set up some classes and uh, yeah thanks a lot for watching and for people that have been subscribed forever uh, really I appreciate that you've stuck with me all, all these years and I know my content is all over the place but there's nothing I can do <laughs> maybe there is we'll see not promising anything. Thanks a lot.